Hello, this is Matthew Chan and Wes Weaver, and welcome to the latest episode of the Turnkey Investor Show. And uh, we have a, a good topic lined up for you today, at least I think so. And uh, Wes, you like this topic too, we talked about it, right? It's kind of important, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, a somewhat important, and it has to do with determining the value of a property. Now, I like to choose topics where Wes and I have a lot to say about it. Now, it doesn't mean that we always agree, but we have a lot to say about it to fill up the episode. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously Matt and I, our background is real estate. So if you want to get into real estate, before you can even worry about buying or renting or wholesaling or flipping or whatever you want to do, you've got to determine the value of that property. So this is very important. This is kind of where it begins. If you can't determine the value of, of a property, you're going to have a hard time with the rest of it. Now, let me set this up, Wes. Okay, now we have a bias, and the bias is we're not in the wholesaling business, we don't flip properties. Uh, not, not to say we would never do it or make an exception, but as a general rule, rule, when we buy the property, we tend to hang on to it. Right. I mean, that that is generally the goal. Well, no matter, yeah, no, and no matter what you're gonna do with it, if you, if you buy a property right, you've heard the saying, you make your money when you buy. And that's really is true the case, because I've, we've sold some houses to tenants who we really had no intentions on selling the property when we bought it, but if you buy the property right and you know how to determine the value, if you decide to sell it later, or if you have to fire sell it, or if the market turns on you and values kind of go in the tank, if you can determine the value and you buy it right, then even if you decide to sell it or things change later, you'll be glad you bought it right, so to speak. Okay. Well, I would say, Wes, that value is uh, sometimes very subjective. It is very, sometimes very subjective. One person say, well, there's a good deal. Another person says, well, so-so deal. Would you agree with that? That's true. That's true. Uh, I mean, just since you said that, I remember I have a, there's a property that I own with, with someone, and we were driving to the property, and we couldn't find it. We stopped and asked directions with a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And the neighbor, uh, he said, oh, yeah, it's around the corner. I've already looked at it. It's a, it's a terrible deal. It's trash. You know, you can never make any money. <laughs> and we bought it, and it's, it's, it's one of the... the largest equity um, position properties that we have and so therefore so that guy you know he was trying to even keep me from going over there he said it's terrible you you, you, you can't do anything with it and we went bought it and it's a great property so yes depending on the land you look through and your perspective um, a deal for you or not a deal for someone else may be a deal for you so okay well let's start from the very very basics okay Did, lots of times uh, what's taught to de determine the value of a property is looking at comps. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are comps? Uh, comps are comparables that a real estate agent would have best access to through the MLS service, the mm -hmm. multiple listing service. That's mm -hmm. the best way to kind of pull comps. So, there again, this is where you want to network, you know, find a, a real estate agent uh, who can, even if you're not buying deals from them, buy them lunch, do whatever you have to do to maybe have email access to where you can send them an email and say, hey, can you send me some comps? And if they know what they're doing, that agent should be able to send you comps with spending less than three to four minutes of their time. And so comparables, now, and make sure when you look up compar comparables, what I like to do, you can look at things that are active, mm -hmm. but you need to look at things that have sold. Because that's remember, right. what's on the market for sale doesn't necessarily mean that's what the market will bear. So I, look, I like to look at, okay, well, maybe what's for sale, what's my competition? But more importantly, I want to see what are, what are houses actually closing for. Because uh, on the MLS, on the multiple listing service, it'll tell you um, how much closing costs a seller paid, and all of that takes into account actual value. So Now, uh, when I came into Columbus, or, or for that matter, whenever I go into any city uh, mm -hmm. looking at different uh, the properties, because I get curious, you know, mm -hmm. you know I travel quite a bit, and I, get, I have a natural curiosity to say, I wonder how much this neighborhood is worth, and the houses. Now, obviously, if you're just kind of scratching your head and just kind of wondering, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get a real estate agent in every one of these markets. So uh, one of the things that I would say is that if you're at least starting out and you don't have those contacts, sometimes getting a whole bunch of uh, magazines or mm -hmm. these sales. Now, again, I want to like, like Wes said, it is primarily what that's the asking price. Right. However. There is a way for you to, I think, for you to calculate. And I think that formula is anywhere, depending on the area, of course, but mm -hmm. this is a very broad generalization, is to take like 5 to 10% off. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because um, it pretty much allows for the realtor commission. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a certain amount of padding. Sure. You know, because no one wants to sell a property and right. have to come out of pocket. Right. So you can pretty much assume 
that whatever the selling price is is going to be inclusive of the realtor commissions. Would you agree with that? Yes, there's going to be anywhere between you know six to seven percent of the real estate commission, and sometimes two to three percent in closing costs. So sometimes you can say anywhere between five and ten percent of that uh, sales price is going to get, just get blown away in fees right away. So you can take that into account when you're looking at these asking prices. Right. Absolutely. And also the things I would offer to say is a lot of these properties are kind of retail ready. Yes. For the most part. Yes. I mean, of course, you'll see some fix-ups and things like that, but they're mostly retail-ready houses, and so they're retail value. Yes, and, and, and these houses are being marketed to the end user, the person who's going to live in the property. I mean, that's you know probably you know seven out of ten of the properties on the market, or even maybe even more, are marketed towards you know um, first-time home buyers or home owners. So that's the, right. the end user. Yeah. So you know, so anyway, um, I think that's a e quick and easy way to get a sense of the value of a property of a neighborhood. Now, drilling down, I know we're going to get down to this is your favorite. This is your favorite. You know where I'm going with this. Square footage. Square footage. You, ever since you became, uh, uh, you know, a real, real, real estate agent, yeah. that's all you lived and bought. And you know, and of course, I'm not in there. I understand the concept, yeah. but I'm still like a broad stroke guy. I still say, well, it's a three one house. Man, this one's about fifty five thousand. That, that that is. It's very broad yes, stroke. Right. Right. It is more, it's, it's fairly unscientific. Yeah, looking at square, looking at price per foot, it's just one of many ways that I look and put in the overall equation. So, yeah. yes, you know, you may have a house in a neighborhood that's, for example, I'll give a great example of the, the neighborhood that I live in. My house is uh, about 1,700 square feet. Most houses in my neighborhood are like 1,200 square feet. So, where square feet has to come into play and where people get in trouble is they say, okay, well, uh, this neighborhood is selling for $100 a foot or $120 a foot or whatever it may be. And they'll, and they'll take that and they'll say, okay, well, I have 1,700 square feet. And they'll multiply it and they'll get this, and they'll get this <laughs> big get this number. Crazy yeah, number. Yeah, this big it doesn't number. fit. It doesn't right. fit that neighborhood. Right. So you may come up with a, a yeah. sales price of 160000 yeah. when the neighborhood is only bearing 120 or 130 or so or even less. So, so square foot, I like to look at it. it. It's just one nugget that I put in to the overall equation. Well, I agree. Yeah. It, it is a factor to look at. I mean, yeah. but in itself, I think, you know, some people, they, they, they look at it too closely. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the thing about it is, as you pointed out, the square, the dollars, the cost per square footage, there's a multiplier factor that's built mm -hmm. in. So the larger the house, the larger the multiplying effect is. Yeah, so, so whether it's like a dollar or, you know, a couple bucks more or less, mm -hmm. it's much more significant when you're talking about a larger house than when you're talking about a smaller house. Yeah, sometimes sometimes price per foot. If if you're really in a focus area or like a focus neighborhood where uh, the values are very um, kind of protected, sometimes looking at the price per foot can tell you how you are competing with the neighbor. So you know if you're you know without looking at how big someone's house is, you can just glance down at the price per foot and you can say, okay, well Joe bought his house at ninety dollars a foot. Sue bought her house at ninety five dollars a foot. And without having to figure out, okay, well you know Joe's was this big and Sue's was this big, it can just it's a it can give you a real quick snapshot. Of what kind of value per foot they got. So, um, yeah, that, that's in a real tight neighborhoods, it can be very helpful. Okay, now I haven't asked you this question in a long time. Uh -huh. And uh, so I don't even know what, what Wes's answer is going to be. But uh, you know uh, the general area that we like to invest in, in the east side of uh, Columbus, mm -hmm. and that general area. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a nice blend between. You know, really run down, crime ridden, all that versus real high end, and mm -hmm. you know, it, it cash flows and it, they're solid neighborhoods. Right. Agreed. Yeah. So, so, so when I go when I go running through the neighborhood, I still to this day um, say, well, this is this little block here. This is about a sixty sixty five thousand dollar mm -hmm. uh, block, um, and I still take a very broad stroke approach to it. What do you what What's your opinion when I do something like that? Well, it depends on... And that's my starting point. I'm not saying that's where I am. Right, Okay. Right. But I was as, say, a, yeah. as a starting point of conversation, right. without having to whip out a calculator and go run to your computer... Yeah, you should be able to, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're localized in your market, it, what, you're going to eliminate a, a, a large part of your market that's just not feasible. If you're flipping houses, there's going to be a certain market where there are houses that don't uh, resell very well. So if you're in the rental market, there's going to be areas like the, like the really high end areas that you may stay away from. So mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to narrow your market down to, you know, a few pockets probably around your area. And once you do that, you should be able to get dropped from a helicopter in those areas. <laughs> and, and you should know within five seconds, within a, a certain margin of area, what the rents are and what the values are. And if you're not there yet, if you're in the beginning, that's okay. But realize where these areas are and, and, 
you know, and you need to be able to, within five seconds, be able to come up with that. Uh, and it'll just comes through time. It comes through, uh, you know, kind of a few years of seeing uh, houses buy and sell. But for the most part, unless you're in a real volatile market, which we're not, things just don't change that much. So once yeah. you kind of get a feel for it, mm -hmm. you're, you're pretty safe. Yeah, yeah and, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I think that too many beginning investors or very left brain people, you know, the, you know, the engineering types, mm -hmm. they, they want formulas. They yeah. want formulas, they need that regimen, they need a process. And I've, I can punch, as you, you know yeah. me well, I'm, I'm very technical and I can right. dig into spreadsheets, I can figure out things to the penny, right. but you know, there is a place for those type of, you know, that yes. type of analysis. Yes. But I got to tell you, single family houses, at least as far as we're concerned, ain't that complicated. Right, it's not. And I think, you're, I think, <laughs> I think you know, our audience will be better suited by kind of being able to take a big picture, holistic view of, you know, what am I trying to do? I mean, if you're buying this property for rental and, you know, if you're off a few thousand dollars or if you've got to pay a few more closing calls, if it's a great deal and you're in it for the long haul, which is the, which is the play that Matt and I have, you know, those minutia numbers or maybe those small percentages from crunching those numbers how they may come out in my opinion it's not going to make that huge of a difference um, mm -hmm. i mean you, what's going to make a larger part of the difference is, is and this is a whole nother topic is deferred maintenance <laughs> yeah you know, we're not that, getting we're not important. getting yeah we're right, not getting that's more this important episode. that's more important <laughs> <laughs> but that, but my point is yeah, my point much. is yeah. is that, that there are things that are more important than being on your number you know, to yeah, the to penny. the dollar, right? right. Exactly. Everything's I mean, more people, important. So I'm trying to put the value in perspective yeah. to other things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, you know, if you're, if you're trying to drill down, I think even to the nearest hundred dollars, I mean, you're going you're way, way too far. far. Yeah, yeah way you're too going, far. you're drilling the down deal, way too the deal far. Is way too thin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you shouldn't have to go down that far. No. But uh, okay, well, moving on and relating to value, let's talk about. Well, I, actually, before we go on to the other areas, let, let's talk about appraisals. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of appraisals and appraisers in general as a broad stroke? I have a nice little spot right in my um, filing cabinet where appraisals go after I buy a property. I close the door and that's the last time I look at them. Wow, that's, that's those are pretty harsh words. What if some appraisers are listening to this? I, you, know, <laughs> you might have hurt their feelings. No, no. I mean, appraisers <laughs> exist for the banks. They don't exist for you. Ooh, whoa, tough, tough words. <laughs> See, people, uh, see, I always get a bad rap for being the tough guy. Now, you listen to what this guy is saying. I mean, <laughs> a pre, a, you know, Matt and I talk about this dozens of times off camera, but there is a huge difference between appraisal value and market value or street value or fair market value, or whatever in, you want to call it. Us investors, yeah. Well, whatever whatever you want to call Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah. the appraiser will appraise a house for the bank and basically for your loan purposes, make sure that the bank is not overextended or that the, the appraiser is making sure that the bank is making a good deal loaning the money to you. But for better or for worse, whether they're high or low, I really could care less what the appraisal, what the appraisal came in at as long as it met the numbers to where I could buy the property, where I could close the deal. That's all I was interested in. Yeah, in my opinion, it's sort of like the square footage thing. It's one little notch. Right. Now, am I gonna put this weight? I mean, I'll put a little tiny bit of weight, Yeah. but I, I gotta tell you, um, you know, unless they have a good case for the appraisal, Yeah. You know, it's it's a hit or miss as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some that were accurate, some are a little over, some are under. They're just all over it the is. freaking and, place. You know, and appraisers can find a way of finding comps and finding things. I mean, a real quick story. I bought a property. Mm -hmm. I was under contract for like thirty-five thousand dollars. This is a crazy low-end property, but this is back in the day. I felt like it would cash flow really well. Well, so I met the appraiser out there, and when he walked in, he said, "You know, I've, he said I remember this house. I've appraised this house before." I said, "Oh, really? Okay, good." You know. And so he called his office to get some information. He said, hey, didn't we just appraise this house like a year ago or two years ago, whatever? And she said, yeah. And, I, you know, I could hear her on the phone. And, and he said, well, you know, what did we appraise it at a few years ago? And she said, 65000 And I was just about fell out. <laughs> I mean, of course, and he kind of started laughing. He said, oh, okay. And so, I mean, there was no way in this There was world. no basis of reality. Yeah, right? I'm just like, you yeah. appraised this house for 65000 two years ago, and I'm under contract buying it for thirty five, and it's probably worth... 40 or 45, you know, and, and it was just, it was just crazy. So that is kind of a, so that's the kind of little small window yeah. of view in, in appraisals. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, to this day, I don't have any friends uh, that are appraisers. I mean, normally you meet somebody in the business, you can, and I think you may, you might have a contact mm -hmm. or two, 
but I don't have any friends in the business. And uh, so appraisers, I don't know. Um, I, I would like to have an appraiser friend which I can call, but obviously it hadn't stopped me or us you know, yeah, from I mean, going forward. By not having a, a contact as an appraisal, it's not going to hurt your business. It's not mm -hmm. going to slow you down. It's not going to stop you. Uh, there's just one hurdle that you have to get over in your buying process. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, Wes and I are pretty much in agreement. I mean, appraisals, I mean, they're kind of a neat little instrument. It's nice to have, but uh, it certainly won't stop us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're confident in our abilities to uh, move forward with or without an appraisal. Absolutely. So there you go. Okay, all right, now we're gonna move on to more of the softer issues here, which is a little bit harder to quantify. Again, this is gonna make the engineering types, make, make them a little dizzy, mm -hmm. because I know those guys, they, they need something to plug into their spreadsheet. They wanna right. punch in a calculator. But unfortunately, these things, as far as I know, you can't put it in a calculator. So. A lot of things you can't. Yeah. Okay, so let's, top, let's start uh, with the real, real obvious stuff. Let's talk about crime and drug areas. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, Wes. Give me a couple words on uh, crime and drugs well, areas. Well, you know, crime and drug areas, what I find is that you can't always predict them. You know, you may judge a neighborhood, and a neighborhood can change like that. I mean, a few people moving in or out can greatly change a neighborhood. You may have a house that's just, you know, a terrible property because it has one or two you know, high traffic areas, getting a, a lot of rowdy people and just, you know, bad people. Well, you know, the same 80-20 rule applies. You may have 20%, if you have, you know, a, a few people can ruin the whole street. And you'll, we, and we've had this in some properties. Once those people either move on or get evicted, it's like the whole neighbors, like the, the rest of the good people, the 80% of the good people kind of come out and all of a sudden it's fine again. So, you know, but know where those areas are, you know, if you if you are investing in the area you live in, most likely you already know where they are. You know where those streets are. So yeah. just kind of shy away from them, steer clear because you're going to have a tough time with rentals. You know your tenants are going to uh, they're going to turn over because they're going to get tired of the riffraff. So you're going to have short term um, people, and you know vandalism, air conditioning stolen, copper stealing, you know the, the work. So just kind of steer clear of them. Well, I think I have a little bit more of a harsher opinion, especially if you're a beginner. If you know there's a place that has a reputation for crime and drugs, mm -hmm. and when I say crime, I guess we can talk about it as something like property royal, like vandalism, but I mean, obviously if it goes into somewhere like violence, people beating each other up and right. that kind of thing, I say stay the hell away. I mean, yeah. I just don't, especially if you're a beginner, it is not worth it. There is no right. deal worth that aggravation. I don't care how attractive that property looks on paper right you know unless you've got a little bit of stomach for that kind of thing going in right if you're a beginning person stay away from that kind of drama there are many many deals to look at just I just feel that's just my opinion just stay yeah. away from it yeah just just go to another area yeah. and you may not even have to go that far if you like the area just start driving around and you may you may be within one or two miles of, of that sweet spot of where you want to be but yeah I agree just stay away from it Okay. Um, now, if you're more experienced, um, what do you think about that? I mean, crime areas? Yeah, crime and drugs. I, have, I mean, I have, you know, I have several properties that are uh, I really would consider that are in that in that area. You know, and they're very management intensive. You have to stay on top of them. I mean, I've I've had a tenant get shot in his living room, still the bullet hole still in the yeah. wall. So I mean, yeah. if you're you know, you have to be. I mean, your management skills are going to have to be really tight on those properties. You have to be more willing to be active. You know, I've yeah. got to tell you, after 10 years of being in this, yeah. I mean, I am, for me, uh, I'm looking for less drama. Yes. Okay, and even if that means less cash flow, even if that means less return, Absolutely. I'm not interested as I used to be. In the beginning, and, you know, right. we were more interested, more active. Right. And I think it's important that we, I yeah. mean, if our viewers are taking the time to watch it, I think it's important that we, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, to let them see through the prism of, of us yes. of, of kind of where that goes. So don't get sucked in to the high cash flow numbers on those low end properties because you're going to look at some of them and you're going to say, well, either I can buy it with all cash or my, my, my loan payment is only going to be $250 a month. I can rent it for five or 600 or whatever it may be. And, but you will find that those properties will be your 20% that are dragging down the other 80% of your portfolio. Oh, that, I, I tell you, that it, you know? it, and when that was definitely true the last two or three years. Yes. And once yes. we got rid of those, yes. you know, because things just got really, really tough. I mm -hmm. mean, in some ways it was a blessing in disguise. I mean, it forced us to look really, really hard at some mm -hmm. of these and say, look, you know, I mean, are these really keepers or not? Right. And... Which actually brings me to the sort of the next line of discussion, really, is that 
um, I think it's important that, you know, we've kind of strayed from our core Columbus mm -hmm. area. I mean, we, you know, we started out in Columbus, Georgia, mm -hmm. and we had a neighboring city in Phoenix City. Mm -hmm. Then we went out to Lee County, right. okay? And, you know, and we've kind of, and of course you've got, we had one in Marion County. I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, we've kind of strayed off and, um, and we did it knowingly. So this isn't like, oh, it was an accident right. or, or, or it's forced upon us. All right. And Wes and I did discuss these mm -hmm. decisions. We were like, okay, we'll give it a shot. Right. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're kind of I mean, willing spirits. But I got to tell you, uh, like this house of Lynette in, in particular, that place had changed so dramatically. Right. You can, and I guess it's, what I want to say is you got to be aware of those declining cities with declining industries. It is huge, huge. Yeah, if you if you have a city around God. you that's that's dependent on one or two industries, whether they're or mill lawyers. or factories yeah, exactly. or one or two big companies, and, and oh those go on, I mean, the place will just be a go. It'll be devastated. It'll oh. be a ghost town. So yeah. So again, to learn through my amount, you know, of ten years experience, you know, moving forward, you know, stick to your core areas. I mean, if you just have some smoking deal that's you know an hour yeah. away or thirty minutes away, okay, look at it. You know, don't. Don't think too small. I mean, think big picture, which is what we like to do, and that's what we were doing. But at the same time, we look at our core properties. Our core of our portfolio is still in our hometown, the properties we're comfortable with. So um, take that into consideration before you venture too far out of your area. Now, uh, okay, so anyway, see, I think the, the, we were, the, the context of this, I mean, the, the purpose of this video is to determine the value of a property. But... Um, the, having declining industries and having drugs and all some of these factors we're talking about don't show up necessarily right. in comps. They don't show up in the square footage. They don't show up in appraisals. Right. These are intangible elements that you have to be aware of yeah. or you're going to get caught and, really hard. And was, when, since we're talking about value, you have to think about if you ever have to dump a property, you have to think about who is going to be your audience. And if you, if you have one of these properties in a, in a low-end crime area, you have to think about your sell your sellability factor. You know, who am I going to sell this property to? How can I sell it? Am I going to have to sell it to another investor? If you're going to have to sell it to another investor, you can uh, bet that they're going to be beating you up on price. So, those are, those are things that you that the calculator is not going to tell you that that you know you you have to look long term and see what is your exit strategy. Yeah, I, yeah, exit strategy is definitely important in determining value. You know, if you're mm -hmm. doing a long-term play, it's a little bit more forgiving mm -hmm. than if you're trying to uh, flip it around or just resell it very, very quickly. Now, um, you know, we're getting, we're starting to run to the end of the episode, but there is a, a, a couple more things I do want to touch on. Now, I'm going to uh, list off some of the things I really dislike. Okay. okay, and see if you and I are in agreement. Am I on that list? <laughs> No. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, Wes is in that neighborhood. I stay away. No, okay. uh, I don't like neighborhoods that have too many pets. You go in there and they're surrounded by dogs. Now, look, you go into working class neighborhoods, you're going to have some pets. Yeah. Okay, I mean that that goes without saying. But I think there is a propensity for some neighborhoods, especially when you get into the rural area. Mm -hmm. They like land. They they just got packs of animals. Right. I don't I don't particularly like neighborhoods that have too many animals. And I don't know how you quantify that. It's more of a feel when you drive through. I don't know. What 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 are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that the yeah, that you know, pets are trying to you know trying to decide if that you know into a value of a property. I don't know. I guess that would be way down in the process, kind of of. of you well, know, I mean, come on. I mean, let's look. I mean, if you have like neighborhoods that have a predominance of pit bulls, we're not talking right. about little dots well, like yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, if, if everyone owns a pit bull, I gotta tell you. I, if they like these dangerous dogs, I don't want any part of it. I don't yeah. want. I really don't. And yeah. I know maybe you and I will differ because the last thing I want is one of these stray dogs, yeah. you know, coming around and harassing my tenants. Yeah. And I think that if you get, if you're in a neighborhood that attracts those type of, you know, uh, tenants that have those pets, you're going to mm -hmm. get those kind of. Tenants. That's true. That's true. And yes, I agree. Like, and it's I'm, not the you know it's certainly right. not the first thing I'm thinking about. Right. But when you but drive through looking, the neighborhood, looking at yeah, I guess looking at things like mass on like, like the pet factor, you know, people will migrate to like-minded people. So I, like attracts like. Like attracts like. So that I mean, that, the more I think about them, that's a great point because if you have the people with all the pit bulls or the, or the you know just pets running the streets or running wild, then you're going to have also you're going to that's going to attract a tenant more likely for you that's going to kind of be like that. So consider that. Yeah. 
Um, now, now another thing is, <clears throat> and I think we've talked about it, is I really, this is probably going to get me a little bit in trouble, and it's like not really politically correct, but I really don't like neighborhoods where there's a predominance of a whole bunch of people. They just like to gang around outside. I don't like going in neighborhoods where there's just a lot of people hanging out, and yeah. I don't like neighborhoods where a lot of, you know, where a lot of the guys, you know, don't matter what race, right. they're showing their underwear and right. they're just dragging out. I mean, Same, yeah. I don't like the cars that are booming. And, Right. You know, they're rocking up and down, and I, I tell you, it doesn't take many of those types right. to drive the perceived value. The house may be just fine, and really, most of the people are just right. fine. Because you have to remember, the, the things that you see when you're driving to these properties to analyze the values are the same things that your prospective tenants or buyers are going to see when they're going to the property. Right. So, if you if they're driving by the barking dolls and the booming radios and the people in the streets where you have to zigzag in and out just to get down the street, they're going to be doing the same thing. So consider that. Okay, but you didn't have a strong position. You just tell a lot of people to consider it. Well, I mean... Of course, you got a, well, you have a gun in your back seat, probably. No, no, no. It's just, you know, it's... I, yeah, I okay, know. well, it's yeah. all right. Yeah, but I guess it is a topic that's, that's kind of non-quantifiable. It is non-quantifiable. Right. And, uh, but I do think that determining a value of a property is thing. more than a spreadsheet yes. exercise. Right. And... And you know, lots of times it has to do with your personality. You yeah. know, I mean, some people, some personalities you're willing to put up a little. I mean, they're very active. They want to get in there. And like I said, me, I'm more in no drama. I want things a little bit easier. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and I like peaceful neighborhoods. I like peaceful tenants. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I, sh I really, I mean, that's just is what, yeah. like, you know, yeah. turns me on today. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So any closing comments about? Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, this is a fairly, uh, op yeah. this is just an open discussion. We didn't have like a, you know, I this mean, isn't like a course, you know, yeah. where we're trying to teach them how to determine a value. We're just giving our opinions of how we look at things. I guess a, a nutshell, kind of some closing comments for me would be to, yes, look at your, um, crunch your numbers, look at your, you know, the price per foot and things, but also pay attention to your intuition. I mean, that, that that's going to carry like you, that. you know, like a that. long way. I mean, because that's what's going to... You know, being a successful entrepreneur, whether you're an investor, uh, you play the stock market, or whatever it is, you've got to you know be a good judgment. You, you've got to have good judgment, and so yes, you have to analyze the deal, but you have to follow your intuition and and mm -hmm. you know just trust yourself. Follow your gut. Yeah. Trust yourself, absolutely. And uh, and the thing about it is, in the beginning, you're probably not going to trust yourself. And actually, to this day, I don't trust myself 100%. That's mm -hmm. the reason why I got this guy around. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, he's only a phone call away, email away. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ask him a lot of little mm -hmm. questions. It's like, hey, can you pull me a comp on a certain property? I mean, I do it to this day. Mm -hmm. To this day. Because, I mean, it's not like I can't figure out myself, but I just like to bounce it off something. Yeah, use the tools and the yeah. people that are available. Mm -hmm. Get the information. Make a decision. And go with it. I mean, exactly. e either move forward or move on to something else, but don't get hung up on it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining uh, Wes and I in this episode um, where, we're ta we, where we talked about determining value of a property, and we hope it was helpful, and we'll see you in our next episode. Thank you. See you then.